I'm Dr. Linda Williams, president of the Medical Alumni Association and a graduate of the class of 1984. We are very excited to celebrate you here today at your reunion. You may not have been back to campus in a while, or maybe you haven't visited the CU Anschutz Medical Campus in Aurora at all. For some of us, me included, our context for medical school elicits fond memories of the Ninth and Colorado campus. But I think you will be excited to see the growth of our alma mater that the Anschutz campus has made possible. Because we cannot have you here on campus, and since many of you have never stepped foot here, we wanted to give you an overview of the CU Anschutz uh, campus in this video from 2019. It continues to evolve and grow and is constantly changes. So since this video, there, there are changes that have been made. All right, let's take a look though at the video, the 2019 video together. In the heart of Colorado, an exciting venture has taken hold. They call it the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus. And for such a relatively young institution, it's already made a remarkable name for itself. Our story starts as all great stories do, with a little imagination. Imagine the future would become a theme over the next decade as the campus embarked on an era of construction, renovation, and rapid expansion, transforming a former army base into a world-class academic medical campus. The campus began to take shape in 2004 with the opening of its first new clinical building, first research building, and the Center for Women's Health Research. Before long, the site was officially named the CU Anschutz Medical Campus in recognition of the tremendous philanthropic support that made its growth and development possible, led by the Anschutz Foundation. UC Health University of Colorado Hospital relocated shortly thereafter, bolstering the campus's momentum. As the opening of two education buildings linked academic programs with clinical care on one campus, the pace only intensified from there. New centers were born, new buildings opened their doors, Children's Hospital Colorado relocated, and entire departments migrated their operations, intent on riding the growing wave of innovation, enthusiasm, and optimism at the CU Anschutz Medical Campus. And with each new beginning came new opportunities for collaboration, growth, and knowledge sharing as interdisciplinary clinics and interprofessional groups flourished, capitalizing on their newfound proximity to one another. In just over a decade, the CU Anschutz Medical Campus has been completely reborn and has already staked its claim to national recognition. While our work is far from over, it's important to reflect on a decade full of accomplishments, accolades, and lives that were forever touched. There is no end game here, no finish line that will ever be crossed, for medicine and health remain ever moving targets as we seek to know today what we did not know yesterday and cure tomorrow what we cannot cure today. The future is bright and the future is here at the CU Anschutz Medical Campus. We will now watch a video tour for the Center for Advancing Professional Excellence, better known as CAPE, and beginning to advanced radiology lab called the Bar Lab. Some of the representatives are here today and we will take questions later. At CAPE and Bar Lab, students and faculty have access to the latest innovations in teaching and learning, including virtual simulation. The technologies available at the CAPE and Bar Lab allow learners to gain real world experience and collaborate with fellow professionals to solve problems. Following the virtual tour, we will have the representatives from the CAPE and Bar Lab available to answer your questions. Let's enjoy the video. Let's start off with going around the room. Introduce yourself and what year you are. I'm Ben, third year. I'm Lillian, also. When we're done in here, one of our simulation technicians is going to bring you back to our two spaces that we're going to be using today. We're going to be working with a PEDS patient and an adult patient. So you have a brief 20 minute scenario, debrief. Brief for your next 20 minute scenario, debrief, and then you're done. 
Hi, my name is Jocelyn Blake. I'm the Communications and Community Relations Manager here at the Center for Advancing Professional Excellence, also known as the CAPE. We are the largest state-of-the-art simulation center in this region. So we want to give you a tour. Come on back. So we're going to go through here. So yeah, you're going to turn left, take your first right into that room. This is one of three high fidelity simulation rooms. They're all equipped with three cameras and one mic to capture what happens in the rooms with the learners, the patients, and the mannequins. So I'm Sarah, I'm gonna be the sim tech operating behind the scenes for you. Um, so this is our kiddo, so she's got some pulses for you. So brachial pulse is gonna be the best. You can also feel her fontanelle really strong. So get familiar with her. Go ahead and take a listen to her lung sounds. She's got heart sounds, lung sounds, bowel sounds. She's um, cyanotic right now. We can create tongue edema and things of that nature. Uh, I thought no pulse is okay. robust. Pounding. <laughs> <laughs> Your bed, though, you do have a brake system on either end, so you can move the bed if you need to. So if you want to get any monitors on your patient, you do need to place all of your leads. Okay, so just go ahead and grab these. Yep, exactly. So you're going to put your blood pressure cuff or anything like that. If you guys want to come on over here, so this is going to be to your question in regards to what you have access to. So if you are drawing any kind of labs, I'm not worried about the colors that you're utilizing. I'm worried about what you're telling your um, lab. So when you call your lab, you say, hey, I need to get, you know, CBC, I need this, this, and this, or whatever. Tell them they're going to come by and pick up your, your labs, your vials, and then they'll call you with the results. So with that, we're not, like, able to pretend we're doing orders on the computer. It's all calling. Is that the same for pharmacy? Like, if you need a medication, you have to call pharmacy Yes. to bring it? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Unfortunately, we don't have that high tech yet. Now, if there's not a medication here, then there's not a medication here. Don't make it up, don't fake it, don't pretend, because we're gonna kind of giggle, like, what are they doing? Why are they doing? If you need antibiotics, whatever it is, call your, call your um, pharmacy and tell them what it is you need and they'll drop it off for you. Okay, this is our adult mannequin. He's kind of a lot cooler. Um, and just we want to raise up the height a little bit. So you're gonna hit, go ahead and play with those pedals. Yeah, perfect. So some things about this guy, I'll let you guys listen to him too, because he's got the heart sounds, lung sounds, bowel sounds. He actually has all peripheral pulses except for his right brachial pulse. So let's go ahead and dig in first and just feel those. Now, if you take a look at his chest rise, his chest rise and fall, you can even check for some um, lung expansion and see, let me know if you see any difference. You can even put your hands on him and see if you can feel a difference. Perfect. Yeah. So we got diminished sounds on that right. He's not raising. Do you hear anything on the left? Some people are better at simulation than others. Some people are like, I got this mannequin. So utilize your team appropriately. Would you make him have crackles again so I could try to hear? Yeah, Is that okay? On, oh, they are. Okay. Yep, lower lobe. Yes. Head on it. You guys are up here. This is our learner hallway, where learners can document their findings on the computer outside the exam rooms, and also learn more about their patient in the door chart. Let's take a look at one of our 15 exam rooms. So it looks like a typical doctor's office, except it has three cameras and one mic to capture everything that happens inside the room with the patient and the learner. The learner could take a history, perform a physical, break bad news. There's so many opportunities. We just want the learners to practice. We're now one of our three consultation rooms where learners can brief and debrief with coaches or faculty. We can also transform this room into various settings depending on the program's needs. I'm Todd Guth, I'm helping direct this course, um, but I'll also be helping run the sim. But I figured we'd go around and do introductions just so everyone else knows people that are presenting with altered mental status uh, or, um, you know, folks or patients presenting with, um, you know, shock states. Uh, so those are the cases that we're going to kind of show you. And so the, the cool part is going to be how you're going to do it together as a team. It's still about getting histories, physical, performing physical exam. What kind of physical exam do you think is going to be good on these patients? You're stuck. You're stuck. That's a great time to call them because if you're stuck, chances are somebody else's. And maybe you just need this collective brain here because there are six of you in this room and that makes you like a hundred times smarter than just six people. And intubation. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Circulation. 
does whoever's lead want to check like the secondary pulses in the mm -hmm. memorable? Mm -hmm. oh. This is interesting. I've not seen this role divvied up this way, but there I feel are like five minutes it remaining. sort of plays to advantage of everyone being medical students, mm -hmm. but it like it plays to everyone sort of got their hands in a little bit of something with the patient. Welcome to our control room. In this room, we're able to view all of the examination rooms, consultation rooms, and simulation rooms. Our faculty are also able to review the performance of their learners. We're also able to review the performance of our standardized patients. With this method, we can provide feedback on both their communication skills and their physical exam skills. Hello. Oh, yeah. The emergency yeah, paramedic, paramedic bringing him in. 28 year old male helmeted motorcyclist hit by a compact car on I 7. He was found 10 feet from his motorcycle in a ditch. His conscious at the scene. Uh, he was non ambulatory and moaning in pain, so we placed him in ceasefire precautions. The patient took off his own helmet before we got there. Um, he denies uh, lack of consciousness, is grossly oriented, but has been unable to recall details of the accident. No change in mentation during transport. Just complaining of left hip pain, abdominal pain. He uh, denies medical problems, meds, or allergies. A uh, family member did show up at the scene, and we were packing them up, so they should arrive shortly. Um, vitals at the scene were 120 heart rate, blood pressure 100 over 50, temperature 37 degrees. Uh, O2 stats 98% and respiratory rate 20. Um, I do have another call. I have to keep going to. I'm going to leave it for you folks, and we'll see you. Thank you. Okay, let's get uh, vitals 190 set up. Get the like, glucose. Pulse ox is on. Um, hello, sir. Can you hear me? How are you feeling? Back on? Okay, let's start. We're going to start today. We're going to take a look at you, okay? Get some stuff set up, okay? Yeah, it looks like it bit. is midline, no deviation. Yeah. But. Yeah. It looks like his left chest is rising more than his right chest. Baby, are you okay? Are you okay? Hi. Hi there, ma'am. Ma'am, we're with the emergency team. Could you, could you hang out back here? I have a few questions for you. Is he okay? I'm putting it in right now. Are you okay, babe? He's still signing. He's still signing. Good care of him. He's doing great. I'm going to call for some labs. CBC, CNP, and uh, Dr. Cross. Can you move your toes for me, sir? Drawing them now. Tell me something. Can we call it Cuddle Puddle? So we got him on vitals. We're waiting on some labs. Hi there. We, uh, we are going to start something for his glucose in 40. Yeah, uh, Dave is calling for 55. Okay. And then, so I imagine we now want to get some imaging. And this is uh, Faith, this is partner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, would you mind uh, also calling for a chest x ray, fast exam, pelvic x ray, absolutely, and uh, an EKG? We're going to do a chest x ray, make sure that okay. they're in the right place. We're also going to do a pelvic x ray. That's just a little bit. Um, Debrief of what's going on. Do you know right what's now? He's back in traction. We've given pain medications. Waiting for that. Do we yeah. want to stop is any blood loss problem? here? So, so we that, have fluid in the. Uh, yeah. so his blood pressure is still okay. dropping. So we want to get some blood drawings for him. We also they're sending a cooler for the messages. Okay. okay. So yeah. we should have heard them reach this point. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, if you could engage in the chat. Fresh frozen plasma. No. Wait, let's, wait, let's, let's, we just need volume, right? Okay. So. What's his blood pressure? Blood pressure is 73 over 45. Okay. And now blood pressure is cycling again. I'm going to get a one-to-one -one push of blood. Yes, he is responsible. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah, I think his interaction is so. on. Yeah. It's funny how, like, you don't realize how many things just happen. Like, when a trauma accident happens, you're like, oh, that's why Jax is always here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> How did that go for everybody? Well-ish, I think. I think what I realize is, I don't know how some things are done in the emergency department. Like, uh, how do you give X, Y, Z? How, how do you perform this test at the same time? Like, I have, I have no idea how you give Epi and how much. Yeah, that's on me. A lot of details yeah. that we no, weren't quite aware of. No idea. Specifically no. with pharmaceuticals. Yeah. yeah. And, you take, and then the going forward, um, I had an idea of like what 
our plan was, but not necessarily like a timeline of that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like what steps we were going to do in what order? Yes. Yeah. 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 I think I'm like calling the phone is a huge part. Mm -hmm. Like that almost yes. I think that needs to be like a designated position. Agreed. Yeah, calling people. Yeah. Well, it's just, yeah. Even yeah. just like getting labs takes mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's just like, but that yeah, like okay. took up a lot of your time. Like, like Yeah. Your plan was to call a huddle after you have finished your primary survey. Did you do that? You did. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our SP training room is used to train our simulated professionals. Faculty write various cases and determine the appropriate feedback for their learners. The CAPE has a very diverse standardized patient pool. They serve in various roles from SimTech to coach to teaching associates. Thank you so much for coming on the virtual tour of the CAPE. For more information, please visit our website. Welcome to the University of Colorado Bar Lab. Dr. Ristori and I are excited to introduce you to a novel concept in radiology education that disrupts the status quo and shifts the legacy paradigm of student learning. The Bar Lab, or the Beginning to Advanced Radiology Learning Laboratory, was designed with a modern, technologically savvy student in mind. We have partnered with Philips Healthcare to develop a dedicated teaching pack system, which allows for review and interpretation of imaging studies in an environment that simulates a real world reading room. Our curriculum is integrated into required clinical rotations and delivered through a combination of individual learning, team-based exercises, and flipped classroom sessions. We're proud that our mission also includes several pipeline programs sponsored through the Office of Diversity and Inclusion at the School of Medicine. These programs provide a unique opportunity for early outreach and creation of an inclusive academic environment. We believe that radiology is the keystone of modern medicine and are delighted to share our vision and excitement for the future of medical education with you. Hi, I think all of you have had a chance to see and meet Jocelyn Blake in the excellent video we just saw, but I would like to reintroduce her at this time. Jocelyn is the Communications, Business Development, and Community Relations Manager at CAPE, and she's here to briefly discuss the facility a little bit more and its latest innovations. So welcome, Jocelyn. Hi. Glad, so glad to be here to talk about the CAPE and all of the amazing things we're doing currently and in the future. All right, I would now like to introduce um, Dr. Corey Ho, the Assistant Professor of Radiology Diagnostics, who will briefly discuss the Bar Lab facility and its latest innovations. Hi, right, thanks for having me. Um, thanks for, for taking a look at what we have to offer these days. Um, the Bar Lab was a joint venture between the Department of Radiology and the School of Medicine, and we thank the School of Medicine for their contribution. Um, it's run by Nikki Ristori and Valeri Portogallo, as well as I. Uh, we, we focus on a flipped classroom experience, team-based experience. Um, it's really awesome because it really reproduces uh, what the radiologist does. Uh, has a full pack system and has dazzling new technology and that keeps the new generation interested. And being in there, uh, the students are extremely engaged and they have self-reported great experiences. Thanks. And Jocelyn, would you like to add anything about um, the CAPE to the video? I feel like the video said a lot about the CAPE. <laughs> mm. um, but I think the most important thing that I just want to make sure everyone um, knows is that we have a very diverse standardized, standardized patient pool for which we are currently running a lot of telehealth sessions due to cor the coronavirus. Um, and our standardized patients have excelled in helping the students with their physical exam skills and their communication skills. Um, and so I'm very, very proud to be able to share the work that they continue to do and help their learners by being 
live instruments for them to, to better their skills. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that you and I talked about before uh, coming to the reunion this morning was the lack of masks in the video. Would you address that? Yeah, so the video with the learners, the simulations, the pre-briefs, the debriefs, those were all filmed last year, BC, before Corona. And so the reason you don't see the students and our standardized patients, our simulation technicians in mass is because it was before BC. So don't be alarmed, everyone. We're taking the precautions now. We're taking all the precautions now. We have no choice. So super grateful. All right. Thank you very much for that. I would now like to welcome our audience to ask any questions of our Cape and Bar Lab representatives utilizing the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Or if you're unfamiliar with the chat box, check the center bottom of your screen and then um, after you click on it, you can type your question into the box. Vanessa Duran, Associate Director of Alumni Relations and Advancement, will, will be reading your questions for our audience and for Jocelyn and um, Corey um, to answer. Eight. We already have a couple of questions. So, Jocelyn, this one is for you. Regarding CAPE, what type of patient scenarios are available there? Different ages such as pediatrics, 0 to 21 years old, and adults over 21 years old? So, we have uh, six different mannequins. So, we have the little baby that's about three to six months old that we do the emergency medicine simulation with. Um, we also have a, a pediatric patient who's about seven can be between seven to nine years old um, and then we also have three adult sized mannequins and we can dress them up however we want we have wigs and clothes and all different types of things to moulage the patients to allow the students to have different um, ages for their scenarios um, we also have standardized patients who vary in age from 20 to 70 and so the Faculty will design specific cases for their learners depending on what they want to assess them on with the physical exam skills and the communication skills. Um, we have a few more for CAPE. Uh, so Jocelyn, how much time do they spend in CAPE? So it depends on the type of learner. Medical students usually spend a lot of time at the CAPE. So their first year, they're doing communication skills with our coaches and our standardized patients. They're also practicing how to take a history. Um, so throughout their four years, they're spending three of those years intensely at the CAPE. Great. When are medical students acquainted with CAPE? For an old timer, class of 1980, the rubber bodies feel too artificial. <laughs> and that is not the first time I've heard that. <laughs> That's also why we have, uh, we call them hybrid simulations because there are a lot of students who are like, okay, this mannequin is like breathing and it feels weird. Like it's good that they get to practice and like we can, I don't want to say kill the patients, but we can <laughs> make them not have life and then <laughs> bring them back to life. Um, and that's good practice for the learners. We can't do that on our standardized patients. And so I think we try to have hybrid simulations where we have a standardized patient in the room with the mannequin to give it more real life, if that makes sense. Perfect. Corey, do all, my, do all medical students do a bar lab rotation? So the main, the main, uh, curriculum we have in the bar lab is a two-week course that we run probably about twice twice a year with about 20 participants each they get the full full-on experience we do use the bar lab uh, throughout just the regular standard medical student rotations um, usually we have the residents go in there and do sessions with the medical students so um, most students do get at least some some time in the bar lab Great. I apologize about that. I was having some issues. Um, let me see. We have another one too. Could you please talk more about the statement in the video that radiology will be such a key part to patient care in the future? Please address the role of radiology in supplementing or surpassing physical exam. So actually watching the, the video of, of the CAPE kind of brings me back to, you know, all the, because I used to, you know, I had to do physical exams and stuff like that back in the day. Um, it just, reminds me of, you know, imaging will never, in my opinion, will never surpass actually physically talking 
and touching the patient and kind of seeing what's going on. But, you know, imaging and technology is constantly evolving. Even, you know, things have changed even when I was a medical student, just, just into this point now. So I think that it's always going to be supplementing um, physical exam and seeing the patient and what the, the primary physicians do. Um, so it's, it's really important that um, medical students, regardless of what they go into, kind of get their hands on some sort of imaging and get some sort of background on, um, on what to order, what to do, because we do spend time mixed in with the bar lab. We do do some dedicated lectures, mainly on contrast and stuff like that. So they kind of know what they're, what they're ordering and what they're getting their patients involved in. Great. And do you utilize standard psychiatric patients? I think that might have been for Jocelyn. I was like, maybe that's for me. <laughs> uh, so we have uh, our standardized patient pool. A lot of them are actors or retired nurses, retired EMTs. And so uh, we don't specifically seek out uh, different types of patients for uh, the sessions, we kind of train the, the patients that we already have in our pool. And so uh, we currently have um, a project with the College of Nursing and their mental health program where our standardized patients are trained on specific cases for the mental health. And this next question is one for both of you. How are the students graded in Bar Lab and CAPE? Corey, you want to go first? Sure. Um, so for the Bar Lab, we have a pretest and a post-test, post -test. so that's you know a set of questions before they start the rotation or the for the very first day of the rotation. We go through the whole rotation, and then the last the last day, um, it's a session that everyone comes in and they they take the post test, and then we can kind of see um, how how they do. And at the Cape, uh, not all of the sessions that happen at the Cape uh, are for testing reasons. We have educational activities. Um, which are more like practice. Some of them are interprofessional as well. And then we also have assessments where they are actually uh, assessed and they're usually assessed by our standardized patients. So our standardized patients, when they're trained on a case, they're also trained on a checklist with communication skills, physical exam skills, sometimes intervention, depending on um, the type of learner. And so they've been trained extensively for years and uh, we have mocks before we do these sessions to make sure that they're assessing the learners appropriately. All right. Have we done away with anatomy? In 1976, we were gifted with donated bodies from where we learned a lot, particularly with a sense of reverence for life. I don't think so. Uh, we actually, so the CAPE is on the fourth floor of Education One. So we're underneath the anatomy lab. They're on the fifth floor. Um, and I think that the learners still find a lot of value in going to the anatomy lab. I think it's just for, for the CAPE, um, is having multiple modalities to learn different things. So there's not just one way to do them. There are multiple ways to, to teach the students and have them practice. Great. In the scenario in the CAPE lab, there wasn't much physical exam done. Does that improve in the years as they keep practicing? So because it was uh, a mannequin, it's kind of hard to do physical exam on a mannequin. Um, the cool feature of the mannequin is that you can change the vital signs, you can have the, the mannequin have a seizure, you can do all these cool things you can do on a mannequin that you can't necessarily do on a human. And so we try to curate the experience depending on what the learn, like what are the learner objectives. So if the objective is for them to to work as a team and to resuscitate the patient, then it's better to use a mannequin. If you want them to learn how to take a history and a physical, then it would be better to use a standardized patient. So it's just making sure you're using the right modality for the learner objectives. Great. This is a question for both of you. Can you talk more about how COVID has changed your scenarios? <laughs> Corey, I've been talking a lot. Do you want to go? I can take this one. So I'm actually really excited about the bar lab and me and Nikki have talked about it, um, about actually trying to go virtual even before all of this B BC as, as, as I like that term. So, you know, we're, we were using this as a springboard to try and do more virtual things anyway. So now that just goes, it just, it just increases or just shortens the timeline where we're going to try, 
you know, in-person sessions are always great and they're always better. People learn better in, in, in person, but you know, that's just not the environment that we live in. So we're, I'm working on curriculum where we can do these all virtual through Zoom and we can all share screens and stuff like that. And I would agree with that message. I think uh, for the Cape, it forced us to jump on the telehealth wagon. Like we were already preparing to do more telehealth sessions, even with virtual reality. Um, but when COVID happened and, you know, campus was closed, we were forced to move a lot of our, our sessions and our scenarios to Zoom. Um, and thankfully, the platform we use, uh, Simulation IQ, which is a learning uh, management system, they have integrated Zoom into the platform. So like even this past Saturday, which we've been forced to do sessions on the weekends because of Corona, because we had to push things back, um, we had a session with uh, doctors, nurses, PAs, uh, gerontologists, um, and these people are all over the country. We had a learner who was in India. It was 4 a.m. where she was, um, and, but we were able to get her through four different palliative care cases in order for her to get a certificate for the program. And so it's been, I won't say it's been easy. It's definitely been a challenge, but it's been a great challenge because we have been able to be more innovative um, and provide access to you know, our education um, processes through Zoom and through telehealth. Great. <clears throat> Let's see here. We have a couple more questions. Um, the bar in CAPE is experimental. Has there been a control group of students who learned like we did in 1976? Can you repeat that? Sorry. Absolutely. So the bar and CAPE is experimental. Has there been a control group of students who learned like we did in 1976? Does that mean with live patients or? We'll see if. Would someone respond to ask the question? We'll see if he responds. Um, we'll move to the next one. Are there any alumni involved in your labs? Um, so we, we work uh, closely with the faculty. So a lot of the cases that are written are written by the faculty. I'm not sure if they are alumni or not, um, but we do have some students or some of the faculty, I know from like the pharmacy program, they once went through the CAPE back in, back in the day. And so now they get to be on the other side of the, the I guess, the screen to kind of curate the cases for their learners. We do have a fair number of faculty that are alumni, so they're inherently involved in creating the curriculum and doing uh, individual sessions as well. All right, um, another question is, are there times that students can go into these labs for extra practice learning times? So we have open labs for the students, but it's, it's something that the faculty and the client, we call them clients, have to um, schedule because we are extremely busy at the Cape. Um, but the students can also, we've had students, you know, email us and say, hey, I want to come to the Cape in an exam room with four of my classmates. Can we do that? And we definitely offer that to the learners as well. So mainly due to the cost of the equipment that's sitting in that bar lab, it's locked and actually closely monitored by security. So we don't really open open it for any uh, other free time when it's not monitored. Okay, this is kind of a follow up question to that and great question. Are there times when alumni can do the labs to update themselves or learn of the new technologies? I haven't had any alumni, but we welcome you. <laughs> I think that would be amazing. It might even be great, you know, to pair some alumni with some current students and y'all practice together and learn from each other. That could be an amazing experience. That'd be great. Yeah, we would definitely welcome alumni. That's a pretty interesting thing to, that we could bring up. I think that is a wonderful idea. A um, few more questions here. As the CU Andrews campus expands, will CAPE or the Bar Lab get more real estate on campus? We actually are. <laughs> I'm super excited. So we're moving into the Andrews Health Science Building, which is currently being built. It's going to be another state-of-the-art building. And so we're actually going to um, almost double the size that we're currently at. 
Um, and so we'll have more space and more opportunity and more technology. And so we're super excited to be, be able to expand. Because right now we're, like I said, we're working on Saturdays um, because we're, we've outgrown our current space. And so to be able to expand and give the learners a more, a more realistic experience, it's going to be amazing for us. There's no, there's no plan for the bar lab. I mean, the bar lab is, is very different than the Cape. Um, you know, we do a lot of more remote, doesn't have to be hands-on. So it, I think it, it functions pretty well as it is currently. Um, during the pandemic, how are students learning differently in the labs? I think, um, I think one of the, the things that I've observed that's been the most difficult is um, assessing the learners nonverbals like it's hard to assess someone's nonverbals through a computer screen like how do you convey empathy and like make eye contact do i look at the camera or do i look at the box like how am i <laughs> how am i conveying that i'm you know being compassionate and i care about what you're saying through a computer screen and so i've, I've heard a lot of learners say that that's been their biggest struggle is having appropriate nonverbals for these types of sessions I assume that's mainly for the Cape, that question. Um, but we're basically operating probably the, probably the same, just mass and, and social distancing. All right, so in follow-up to the previous question I'd asked, um, in 2020, we're being flooded with fake news. Isn't the bar and Cape subject to taking students away from reality, like the real persons with real problems? I don't think so. Like, we have a lot of cases that are um, about real life. And, and I think that's that's the point of the CAPE is um, to reflect the community in which we serve. And so we have cases about, um, you know, refugees or domestic violence or, you know, opioid over or overuse. Like we have a, a myriad of cases. And so it's never to take away from what's happening in real life. If anything, we're trying to mimic real life as much as we can. And that's why I said it depends on the, the learning objectives that the faculty have um, decided upon as to whether we use standardized patients or the mannequins. So obviously radiology is very different, um, but as far as radiology education goes, I feel like it's lacking a lot in a lot of campuses across the US. So I feel like this is even better for, for our, our students because they're able to simulate or actually use a real PACS that I would use when I'm working because, you know, during regular rotations, medical students don't routinely operate the PACS. They don't, op they don't dictate reports and things like that. Kind of just show them the cases and kind of ask what they think about. And this time, this way, they get full control over everything um, without, without any, any real consequence because it is on a identical but separate PACS. Do other health science programs at other universities model their simulated labs after the ones at CU? I think that's a great question. <laughs> I'm not sure that I have the answer, so I don't want to misspeak. Um, but I, I was telling um, Dr. Williams earlier that I worked at a simulation center in Memphis before I came to Colorado to work at the Cape. Um, and when I came to the Cape, I was blown away at how um, they use the standardized patients because our standardized patients not only, you know, do the physical exam and the communication skills in the room as a patient, but they also teach the physical, the entire physical exam to the nursing students and the medical students. Um, they also operate the mannequins. They serve as simicists. So that means they can be a nurse, a pharmacist, a lab tech. Um, they also use their bodies for the sensitive exam. So we have SPs who use their body to teach the female exam and the male exam. Um, and I think that makes them very unique because not a lot of centers are using the standardized patients in that way. Um, so our standardized patients is, I, that's why I say I'm the most proud of them because the way they use their bodies and their minds to help the learners is truly phenomenal. All right, um, do clinical faculty from private practice medical community still come in to provide student instruction? Um, so like when we would just watch the cake video, I don't know if you could see, but that the person who said, he said, my name is Ty Guth. I'm 
um, the director of this course, he actually works um, at University Hospital in the emergency department. So he has real life experience of how the skills work, why they work, and he's bringing that to those briefs to help the learners figure out like, this is what I need to do and this is how I need to do it. Um, and so we have a lot of every, so every session that we have, there is a clinical faculty there to help us curate those cases and those experiences for the learners. I mean, for us, prior practice is pretty cut and dry between this and academic. Um, we do get, VA, we do have um, VA faculty, but that, that's as far as, as it for our radiology education. Uh, this is a great one. Are there opportunities at Cape to work with students from other schools? I think you had mentioned nursing, but pharmacy, and could you talk a little bit about how they're being utilized? So I will say that one of our greatest, uh, I would say, projects is, it's called Interprofession Interprofessional Education Clinical Transformations. And so this project is where all different learners come together. So you could have a medical student, um, a pharmacy student, a dental student, a PT student, a nursing student, all in one session together, right? And they have to go into the room, devise a plan, how are they going to communicate as a team, who's going to do what? And so those sessions happen every Wednesday and Friday until eternity, basically, because it's a part of their curriculum. Um, and those sessions are really important because a lot of the students don't get to practice in those type of interprofessional settings outside of their sessions at Cape. Um, but I think it brings a lot of um, light and also empowerment to them because we hear a lot of them talk about, you know, the hierarchy in medicine or the hierarchy in nursing. Um, and it allows them to kind of tackle those conversations together um, at the Cape in a safe space. Great. Um, how do you train the standardized patients to be consistent across learners? It's really fun. <laughs> uh, it is actually a really fun thing to do. Um, we train them extensively. So we have trainings for every single case that a standardized patient will do. We'll have between a three and a four hour training with them. And as I mentioned earlier, we also do a mock. So it's kind of a dress, dress rehearsal before we do the sessions. Um, and we have the clinical faculty there as well. Um, to help go through the physical exam skills. But as I mentioned earlier, a lot of them are already trained on how to perform a physical exam. Wonderful. Are there any more questions? I think we've answered them in the chat and the Q&A. Um, okay, we have another one. How, how do you decide on what cases are presented to the student? So that's solely the faculty. So the faculty will, sometimes they will come to us and say, okay, we want to have 12 standardized patients who all have a chief complaint of fatigue. And so then either we will write the case with them or they'll come to us with a case already written. Um, and a lot of times the, the students are doing more than one case. So we'll have different standardized patients for the various cases. So for us, each each subspecialty in radiology, um, each section produces their own material to, to present to the students. Okay, and it looks like our last question here is, are there opportunities for students in their early training to get in front of patients? Uh, when you say early training, do you mean like for, so like I, I mentioned earlier, they usually start um, practicing with the patients at like in their first year um, and we even have some programs where um, like the BABSMD program which we um, connected with the downtown campus where we have students who are interested in, in becoming MDs and we do sessions with them as well before they come to campus. Okay great. Um, I think we just had one more come through so we'll end on this one. Do they obtain real cases from their clinics? Yes, uh, they'll change the names, of course, <laughs> but we do have a lot of the cases that were written by the faculty where it was like one of their actual patients. Um, I can recall we did a, a session with some VA nurses and um, the clinical faculty for that, she wrote, I think, four or five cases based on her patient. And for us, the majority of cases 
obviously that they're produced by our, by our faculty are from the hospital. Wonderful. Well, I think those are all the questions that we had. So I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Williams. Yeah, so um, what a great discussion. So thank you, Vanessa. Uh, thank you, Jocelyn, and thank you, Corey. Uh, great information. So I want to thank all of you also who joined us for this very special opportunity. I hope your day and uh, the rest of the alumni reunion is enjoyable. If you are available, we, we would love for you to join us tomorrow at uh, 2 p.m. for a School of Medicine update with, Dr. with Dean John Riley, as well as a virtual student panel. I know that you will be inspired and encouraged by these students who carry on our legacy at CU School of Medicine. So I, I think you would enjoy it greatly. Many of you have already registered, and if not, there is still time to do so. So thank you and have a great rest of your day.